First up, we have Allison Harnsberger with Understanding the Rejection and Acceptance of Non-Dominant Culture Groups Through the Vampire Metaphor and Entertainment. Thank you. That was uncomfortable. No matter how many times we stake them through the heart, decapitate them, douse them with holy water, or shoot them with silver bullets, vampires just seem to never die. While one vampire trend is reduced to ashes, Another one arises from its coffin and take its place in the entertainment canon. Of all the popular mythological figures, the vampire is among one of the most enduring. After all, Stuart Allen, in the 2013 article, Popularity of Young Adult Vampire Literature, which was published in the Mississippi Library's journal, vampire myths are a part of almost every culture on Earth. Vampires are not just used to entertain and titillate readers and moviegoers. In fact, vampires have been used to depict a culture's concerns, anxieties, and fears. Even now, cultural messages are finding life in the undead. Today, I will be discussing how vampires in contemporary entertainment, specifically in recent literature, television, and cinema, are metaphorical devices used to convey the fear and also the acceptance of non-dominant groups in American dominant culture. Now, before we can go into the contemporary vampire metaphor, we have to understand the history and evolution of the vampire myth. Linda Heidenreich, in the 2012 article, Vampires Among Us, which was published in the Peace Review Journal, popular culture has always used vampiric discourse to voice the fear of change, fear of the other, and the fear that the other is bringing change into our communities. Now, there are three main stages to the evolution of vampire myth. The first stage of vampire myth can be traced back to ancient times. For example, in Greek mythology, Queen Lania of Libya would seduce young men, murder them, and then drink their blood. On a similar note, in Jewish mythology, Lilith, who was the first wife of Adam, left Adam after he refused to treat her as an equal. She was then condemned to be a demon who would seduce men and attack women during childbirth. Now, both of these examples of ancient vampires reflected men's concerns that women would gain power, specifically sexual power, over them. Stage one vampires are purely evil, bloodthirsty beings who are completely removed from humanity. There is nothing sympathetic or attractive about them. This takes us to stage two vampires, which is the, vamp the Dracula phase. After all, Inui, in the 2011 article, Contemporary Consciousness, as reflected in images of the vampire, which is published in the Young Journal of Culture and Psyche, finds that Dracula became the model that subsequent vampires would be based upon. Additionally, Dracula was published in 1897, and at the time, the work reflected cultural fears about women's changing gender roles and how that would impact society. Specifically, the defeat of Dracula, the excessively violent defeat, as well as the woman he infects, Lucy, signify British confidence that women's changing gender roles would not impact familial or national stability. Stage two, and rather Dracula vampires, are still evil, but have now become objects of fascination. Humans admire their superhuman grace and ability and find the vampires to be charming. These vampires are still dangerous, but now there is an attractive quality about them. This takes us to the third, most recent stage of the vampire myth. And these are the vampires that we know from Twilight, Interview with a Vampire, and The Vampire Diaries. Modern vampires are more human than ever and struggle to resist their vampire nature. They are morally conscious and often are protectors of mankind, even if they are unwilling to do so. You could say these vampires are hardly vampire at all. These characters now have remorse and are meant to be sympathetic. The, vamp the audience is supposed to root for them instead of against them. Now that we have covered the history and evolution of the vampire lore, we can delve into the contemporary vampire metaphor. Present entertainment shows vampires living alongside humans, but the differences still remain. Vampires may be out in the open in present fiction and may be companions to humans, but they are still not considered part of the dominant culture. This is representative of non-dominant groups being among the dominant culture, but still not being fully accepted. Vampires being depicted as a marginalized group can be seen in the popular book and television series, True Blood. In Maria Lindgren Leavenworth, in the 2012 article, What Are You? Fear, Desire, and Disgust in the Southern Vampire Mysteries in True Blood 
finds that vampire phobia in the true blood universe parallels racism and homophobia in our world. For example, the God Hates Fangs movement in true blood is equivalent to the Westboro Baptist Church's attack on LGBTQ rights. Additionally, the God Hates Fangs movement was formed by religious extremists who felt that vampires should be denied rights because they are somehow unnatural. Additionally, the rejection of interspecies relationships in true blood and the fight for vampire civil rights closely mimics racial discrimination in the civil rights movement of the US in the 1960s. There are several hate groups in the true blood universe that follow the same principles and have the same purpose as the KKK. Now, negative narratives surrounding vampires mirrors how non-dominant groups are perceived. The way the groups are perceived leaks into public policy as the way the groups are depicted affects how they are treated. When I refer to the dominant culture when referring to actual America and not vampires, I'm referring to white, Christian, straight, gender conforming people. Examples of policy in which the US tried to remove the other is California's Proposition 8, which tried to deny same-sex couples the right to marry because they believed it would threaten the institution and sanctity of marriage. This is an attempt to perpetuate the dominant culture and not allow the other to enjoy the same rights that the dominant culture does. Additionally, Arizona Senate Bill 1070 allowed that people who are suspected to be immigrants could be questioned on suspicion alone, and this would make it far easier to remove undocumented immigrants from the country, which again perpetuates the dominant culture's dominance overall. These policies aim to take away privileges that the dominant culture does not have to worry about. However, there is hope that non-dominant groups can be accepted, and of all places to find it, it's found in the vampire romance genre, even in the novels of poor quality that I have put up on the screen. Bernard Beck, and the 2011 article, Fearless Vampire Kissers, Bloodsuckers We Love in Twilight, True Blood, and Others, which was published in Multicultural Perspectives, finds that new vampire entertainment has been created for female audiences. <clears throat> Vampires are considered regular mortal men's romantic competition, which symbolizes women's increasing freedom and ability to choose. Now, new vampire entertainment has often been criticized because it doesn't have traditional horror conventions, but they avoid traditional horror conventions because those usually rely on female obedience to male authority. This reclaiming of the vampire metaphor allows women to empathize with paranormal figures who share their outsider status in a male-dominated society. In these new works, the vampire is not changed or destroyed like in past works, but is instead accepted. This conveys that non-dominant groups are more likely to be accepted by other non-dominant groups such as women before the, non -dom before the dominant culture is fully able to. This acceptance also indicates that it is possible to integrate non-dominant groups into society while still acknowledging that group's unique characteristics. Francis Gateward, in the 2011 article, Every Age Has the Vampire It Needs, which was published in the journal Utopian Studies, says that vampire fiction has the ability to challenge the dominant ideologies of sexism, white supremacy, and homophobia. As I have discussed today, the vampire metaphor is used to communicate the dominant culture's attitudes towards non-dominant groups. Specifically, fiction has expressed the dominant culture's views towards racial minorities, members of the LGBTQ community, women, and other marginalized groups. Dominant cultures have made progress but the dominant culture still does not fully accept them, which is why the vampire metaphor still exists at all. Division still remains, but the, ro the vampire romance subgenre conveys that there is hope that groups can be accepted. I thank you for listening to me today, and I hope I have infected you with some knowledge. <laughs> and those are my references, in case anyone wanted to question those.